Hey, it's Pete. Way too nice to stay inside today. Uh, there's a lot of glare on my screen, so I can't see myself, which is probably a good thing. Just remember to look at the green dot. Okay, so there was, this, uh, there was a list I made of a bunch of topics I want to discuss. One of them is the, mo the books I've read the most times each, and I've got three of them. I'm not going to do them all today. I'm going to do one today. Two of them, I reread them for a particular reason, and one I just read... Uh, over and again and again for pleasure. This is one of the ones I've done for a particular reason. And that's not to say I don't love this book. I wouldn't have picked it for this subject otherwise. But there was a video a while ago from Criminali who we talked about not reading, uh, not rereading very much. I'll try and find that link to it. If not, I'll just look to his uh, channel instead. But uh, and I generally agree with him. I don't read very much, reread very much. So these these three books are unique on that, and that for me, I tend to remember books I really love really well. For example, Shogun, which is people are talking about about a lot now because the movie's coming out. I um, read when I was in high school or just out of high school when it whenever it came out did it come out in 77 if it did I was in high school my parents had the book club edition which came in two volumes this is not a video about Shogun by the way don't know why I'm going into it but and I still remember that book so well it's probably still one of my favorite novels one of my one of my big fat favorite best-selling cultural event novels of all time certainly the other one being probably Lonesome Dub uh, those are two titles that booktubers are not strangers to. Um, both books I love very much. Both books that a lot of people love to reread, especially Lonesome Dove. Um, but they they live so so well in my memory. Um, I just feel like I could only diminish uh, their power by reading them again, especially. Shogun, I would be afraid to reread something like Shogun now because I might not like it anymore. I was 15 or 16 when I read it, it many decades ago. Um, such a great book. I remember it so viv vividly. Anyway, and there are books that I, that I like. For example, the uh, Donald Westlake, Richard Stark Parker series of novels, which have been made into many different movie adaptions like uh, Point Blank and... Um, you know about a about a heist man named uh, Parker, one named Parker. Very good novels. I recently, but something like that, I, I will often get the audio books if I've read the, the real books. I read. I recently listened to all the Parker audio books when I first started traveling because they're short and it's taken a lot of walks around different cities I've been to and stuff, and they were fun to have. And same with uh, a couple other authors like that that I've done it as just an audio book to pass the time if I've already read the story myself. <coughs> then there's another project I'm doing I've mentioned uh, once or twice in passing which, which involves uh, I'm trying to learn Spanish. I've been trying for many years without much success. I'm not good at languages but I've had a lot of success over the past mm, six months definitely but uh, over the past year altogether because of a uh, and I'll link to I'll do put some links in here about this too, even though this is not a language channel. There's a theory of language learning called comprehensible input. It's one of the terms that goes under where you start out by listening and reading very simple things the way a child would and not jumping very fast into talking or conversation or that kind of thing. And so one of the things you can do with that is take uh, little kids' books, read them, or, or give the audio book and listen to them. Uh, I'm very bored by that kind of thing. And one of the tenets of comprehensible input is the, the input has to be interesting. And so a lot of people, I guess, are happy with a very simple uh, level of ABC type readers that you can start out on reading a new language with. But I had, you know, after so many years of trying and failing to learn Spanish, I knew some pretty basic stuff. So I decided to jump right into audiobooks and reading. So what I do, and I do this mainly with two books, but I've also done other material. So I'll listen to 
podcasts. I'll watch movies in Spanish without the subtitles or with just the Spanish subtitles on. And one of the things they that people fear about doing this method is, and they fear when they tell you about this method, is they're, they're afraid you're going to be bored if you don't understand anything. I've never really worried about that. I, I've never worried about reading above my level or getting into things I don't understand because you can always go back to it and so I watch movies without subtitles all the time I don't care if I don't know any uh, every detail of the story if I'm curious I, I, if it's a big movie you can usually look it up on Wikipedia and find out what you missed so there's two books um, that I've been reading the one I'm going to talk about today is called The Invention hope you can see that, of Morel that's the English title the Spanish title is almost the same La Invention, uh, uh, La Invention de Morel. It's by Adolfo Bioy Casares. Adolfo Bioy Casares. Translation is. Uh, it's not going to show me what the translation is. I'll put it in the notes. Um, I don't know if this is the same edition I have. So I think this is the same edition I have. Uh, oh, it doesn't matter. I mean, this is the translation you would get in English. Ruth Elsie Sims. This particular book I've never read in English translation, so this I picked for a couple reasons. It's the audiobook is three and a half hours long. Uh, the print book is a hundred pages long. I didn't know much about the story, so I thought it would be a really good test. I would just keep listening to the audiobook of the story. I bought the audiobook and I bought the uh, ebook of the Spanish edition, so I keep listening to the audiobook of the story as I read along silently. Um, you know, with the ebook. So the ebook uh, so the audiobook version I have is I want to shout out the narrator. If I can find it. Oh my god, that's not even my it's not even my um, right app. Uh, let's see if it even says information about the book. Narrated by Andreas Newman. Andreas Newman. Um, I think, okay, the author, Bioy Casares, is Argentinian. I'll go into that a little more in a minute. And the, as far as I can tell, the, the narrator is narrating it in an Argentinian accent. They have a, like, sort of schwa sound instead of, like, quesadilla. They would say quesad, quesadilla, kind of. Um, it's very beautiful language, so I enjoy his reading. I mean, it's a very beautiful accent in a very beautiful language. So, I wouldn't have guessed before reading this and watching a lot of compre hem comprehensible input on channels like DreamingSpanish.com, which is all in Spanish but leveled, leveled down for uh, native English speakers or any, any non-native Spanish speaker, really. So, just the fact that I'm starting to learn these little nuances of the language is really interesting to me. Now, um, Bioy Casares, he's not that well known in English. He has a lot more books published in Spanish than he does in America right now. He's mostly known as the best friend of Jorge Luis Borges, who's the, one of the greatest Spanish language writers of all time, one of the greatest South American writers of all time, one of the greatest Argentinian writers of all time. He was about a decade and a half, maybe younger than Borges. He was married to Olivia Ocampo. Oh, man. I hope I got her name right. Not Sylvina. Okay. He was married to Olivia Ocampo, yeah. Who, or was he married to Sylvina Ocampo? This is embarrassing. Anyway, another close associate of Borges, the Ocampo sisters, who uh, Olivia and Sylvina, who were, uh, if I'm pronouncing the names right, Sylvina was a short story writer. Olivia, uh -huh. Olivia was the publisher of Sur, which was a, a literary journal that they published all their friends in, and many of these people came to prominence. So they were part of a, a major literary movement in Buenos Aires at that time. Uh, this book, The Invention of Morel, is from was published in 1940. I think it was. Uh, Bioy, they called him Bioy for short. It's, I think it was his first major work. Definitely his first major work. He published other things. He, according to some things I've read, he was a little behind 
the Ocampo sisters and Borges in terms of his literary development. I read a funny interview once with Borges saying like when he would read, you know, they'd get together and read their, work, their works in progress to each other. That, you know, we, we would finish whatever he'd written and just no one knew what to say. They were so embarrassed for him. But then he, he wrote this novel and he, he started to come along and Borges really admired this novel. He writes an introduction to it, which is not included in the... The introduction is included in the print version of the translation, which I showed, and it's included in the Spanish language translation, American, the North American published Spanish translation that that is popular in the United States. <clears throat> not included at all in the audiobook version, and I don't know if it was later they did, or his estate wanted to charge too much for the rights to re, re uh, to include that as well, or what, I don't know. But uh, he high, highly praises this, this novel. Um, the edition I had before the one I showed you, the one I showed you had the cover of, uh, had a, a still of Louise Brooks, the silent film actress, the great silent film actress, which was an uh, inspiration on BYU for this novel. I read someplace that his inspiration was he was sad that she wasn't making any movies anymore by 1940, and there's a character in here that after you've seen that cover, you could you'd be hard pressed not to assume was the was inspired by Louise Brooks, a, the, a character named Faustine. I'm not going to go much into the plot, not that I care about spoilers, but one of the pleasures of this book, which I've read slash listened to at least 35 times, I estimate, in my pursuit of Spanish. So I know the plot pretty well. I've never really read a, uh, I purposely avoided uh, summaries of it and that kind of thing um, so that I can kind of progress my own process. Uh, I can mark my own process of understanding it just from listening and listening and listening and listening. I do look up words every so often. I try and avoid them. Sometimes I'll wait till a word is extremely irritating. And there are flaws to this method because, I mean, if you're reading it purely for enjoyment, um, because, like, there was one word, I think it's bombas. And so for half, half, half the times I read this, probably 10, 15 times I read this, I thought the island that uh, this book takes place on was, like, booby trap with bombs before I noticed that there was another definition of bombas below the main one and it's not bombs, it's pumps, like water pumps of some kind or power pumps. Um, so there's things you can really get off track if you do this method, but if you don't care because you can always, I can always read it in English later. I'm really motivated to learn Spanish because when I get done traveling uh, the world, I will probably end up retiring someplace in Latin America where I have friends and, and I always wanted to very much because of my early uh, love for the work of Borges, I've always wanted to speak, to learn Spanish, at least to read it. And I sometimes get attracted or get tempted to follow other languages, or try to learn other languages too. But I fear if I just keep focusing on this one, once I get up to a certain number of hours of comprehensible input, I think about 600 hours, it'll be time for me to start hiring an iTalking tutor for conversation, that kind of thing. Um, so there's, it's kind of a controversial method. Uh, people who have used it really swear by it. I know that for years and years I used like Pimber, Pimsler audiobooks and I mean Pimsler audio lessons. I think I did the five, five sets of Pimsler audio lessons. So that's 150 half hour sessions, 75 hours. I've done that at least three times plus other methods that come along and, you know, different things. And, but in, this, in the last six months, I've learned more Spanish, or to comprehend more Spanish, than I have in, in 25 years before. So I recommend it if you're interested in that kind of thing. Uh, back to the book, I, the story takes place on an, on an island. There's a, a shipwrecked person on an island. I won't tell you even how he gets there, because just... Uh, or why he can't leave, and he starts to discover some mysteries on this island, uh, which he describes as like his diary is the, is the format it takes, his writings about the island. He 
is an Argentinian person. He, oh, I'm going to start going to the top. Even mentioning the genre of this book, I, I don't want to do because I think one of the, the pleasures of this book is, is discovering what genre it's in. There's, there's different phenomena that happen that he's trying to decide for himself if he's insane or if there's ghosts or whatever it could be that's going on on this mysterious island. It was The book was an, uh, an inspiration on Robe Grier and the screenplay he wrote for last year at Marion Bob. The audiobook has a still from Marion Bob. Robe Grier later claimed that he was not influenced at all by this novel. And I don't know, maybe, I mean, if he read it, he'd be influenced by it. By, and it is a book that he praised, so that's two major world writers of the mid 20th century who highly regard this novel, Borges, who was B.O.A.'s friend, so he might have been biased, and Robriere, who used it as the inspiration for a screenplay, then claimed he hadn't. It's also mentioned in the, the TV show Lost, and it's shown up, Sawyer reads it at one point um, and you can see kind of see the connections there not literally connections but you can see where if some TV writer had read this book they'd think oh that's cool I could use some of this stuff in my viral TV series Bioy uh, Cesaris other than this book in English he's most famous as I said for being Borges' friend and for co-writing with his wife and Borges this, this giant uh, anthology of fantasy stories, world fantasy stories, which is popular in Spanish and then was translated into English, has all of their names on it. He also wrote a series of stories with Borges under a couple different pen names that uh, one is Bustos de Mec, which are very Borgesian kind of stories, you know, that deal with artists and like sort of intellectual pursuits of artists and, and different strange uh, uh, methods of working and methods of working out problems and intellectualizing of literary pursuits that if people are familiar with Borges' other work they would know pretty well. This book's no longer available in English because it, like many of other Borges' other books during his lifetime were translated into English by Borges and a collaborator named Norman Thomas D. Giovanni. Those are excellent books. If you can find them used, definitely get them. Uh, after Borges' death, Borges' widow didn't want to pay the royalty amount that, that Borges had agreed to D. D. Giovanni on, which is like half, which is you know ridiculous for a... Uh, a translator to get half the royalties and especially from a big market like the United States but, but Borges felt that uh, the collaborations were so strong and and he always had the strange idea Borges always had like a very sort of inferior feeling about his own use of Spanish and translation into English I believe in a lot of ways he thought English was a, a superior language for for writing and he he was probably over, overly generous and, over, and overly uh, self-deprecating in that, but, you know, a deal's a deal, and it's unfortunate that there was no way to work out a better deal, because the, the, book, the, books, the book of Sand uh, and a lot of the other later Borey's books, the book of Sand and uh, Dr. Brody's report especially, were great books. Borges, I believe, should be read in small doses. His books, most of his story collections were in about 100 page, 150 page editions. Now, for those stories, all we have in English is this horrible translation by Andrew Hurley in the complete, the, the complete stories of Borges. This big omnibus where Hurley is obviously a terrible translator. I'm not an expert, but I just, I just can tell that the changes he made to titles and things like that. There's a story called it's called Funes the Memorias, and it's a Borges story about a man who's cursed with perfect memory. He can never forget anything he's ever read or said or seen in his life. The story is in Spanish, it's called Funes il Memorioso or something. Now that form of word 
memor memorioso would translate doesn't directly translate into English. He's not funes the memorious, which would be literally by the dictionary dic dictionary dictionary definition funes the the, mem the memorable Mr. Funes or something like that. But he's but there's no word in English for. Funes, the most person with the most memory guy. Um, so they, Borges and Di Giovanni had, had settled on the title Funes the Memorius, which is very similar and it has the same rhythm as the Spanish title. It means something a little different. You could argue that it's still on topic for the story because this person with this terrible curse of absolute memory of everything that's ever happened is a memorable character so you could take it that way Andrew Hurley with his with his pedantic sense of translation decides to to, to call it Funes comma his memory and it's just a dumb title it's not pretty it's not beautiful boy is a very beautiful writer uh, 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 very fine poet known the world over as a poet as much as a short story writer so you know, a lover of great world poetry, a lover of the the Scandinavian, the Eddas, and Beowulf, and ancient writers, and ancient poetry, and, and, and lines of prose, and lines of poetry, so I really think, and that's just one little rant about Andrew Hurley, another rant is that uh, you can find some of Borges' books in shorter editions, you can find uh, Labyrinths and Ficciones, in the editions that first came out in English with different translators. Those are great. But to see them all masked up into this this complete series of Borges Penguin Edition, which is like an oversized trade back. Uh, it's like 700 pages long of all these five-page stories. It's just not the way to read Borges, I don't think. You should read them like a poet. But you should dip in and out, dip in and out. So... If you can find the early editions that are translated in English by Norman Thomas de Giovanni, who's Borges' widow, who married him when he was about 80 in an absentee marriage. They got a license from, they got a license, a marriage license, without having to show up in some distant province of, of Argentina um, so that she could be the manager of his estate once he passed. She's much younger. I mean, obviously, that's his choice, and he and she obviously devoted many years caring for the aged Borges, who was blind and probably not that easy to get along with and stuff, but I, I really feel like some of the decisions that have been made about Borges since his death have just been mon money decisions, and he obviously did not think that way himself, or he wouldn't have given half of his American royalties to Norman Thomas T. Di Giovanni. So it's sad. It's uh, maybe I'm making too much of it. It's just since I love Borges so much, it's something that's always bothered me that these early editions of Book of Sand and um, Dr. Brody's report, particularly, are are not in print in these great superior translations to what was done later. And apparently, we're just stuck with Andrew Hurley now. And people, I see people online, and they and they, they buy the big, the, you know, they'll they'll see one star, one Borges story. Ton Ukbar Orbis Tertius is one that people like a lot. Oh, wow, this guy's insane. These stories are just mind blowing, and they are. And even in the bad translations, Andrew Andrew Hurley puts out, they are, but. Then they buy this big fat book and they probably read like half of them or even if they read them all but they read them too fast and you don't they don't have the time to really sit and contemplate each one because they are really perfect little miniatures and there's four or five that get talked about all the time and if you even skip those four or five you'll find that the others that people never talk about are also perfect little miniatures and i don't know how i got on board i'm supposed to be talking about Casares. so if you like Borges and you haven't read Buick Casares, definitely read The Invention of Morale. If you want to learn Spanish, you can read a whole book in three and a half hours and feel like you've accomplished something. It's a pretty simple prose. 
on that uh, account. Uh, there's one other book I do this with. I kind of alternate back and forth. Then I'll go off and try other things, and I try to read some simpler things, and I watch a lot of websites where they do comprehensible Spanish, which I'll link to at least one, uh, called Dreaming Spanish, where you can kind of look at their, their material there, and you can read more about the whole concept, which is very fascinating, and it works for me. So I'm kind of a tele, I'm kind of an evangelizer for it, but there are plenty, plenty. If you just get into languages, you could just do that all day on YouTube and never get around to BookTube because there's so many people doing comprehensible uh, language type content. What else do I want to say about Bioy? I would like to read his other books, the ones that are available only in Spanish. Um, I wish he had a better reputation in English. He's kind of just known as Boy as his friend and I guess that's how I know him too. I'm grateful that I found this book because of that. Uh, I'd be interested if anybody's read it and what they, what they think of the, the story. It's, it's cool. Bear in mind this was written in 1940. Um, yeah, if I talk much more I'm going to want to go into the plot. It is a desert island story the original cover I had for it was kind of a, like a line drawing of a guy with like a Robinson Crusoe kind of outfit on and tropical things around. That's not really the kind of desert island story it is. You know, then you just, before I had read it, I had seen this, this New York Press edition with a, or New York Book Review edition. There's such a great publisher, the one with uh, Louise Brooks on the cover that I showed that. probably thematically more correct, as is the audiobook version, which is a still from the movie last year at Marienbad, because it's it's not a story of survival, and, uh, I mean, it is, but it's not a story of, like, uh, it's not a man-against-nature kind of story, I guess I'll put it like that. It has some other parallels to other famous works of fiction, which, if you read the Borges introduction to it in one of the editions, you'll you'll pick up on two, and I think I'll leave it there. That's a pretty long rant, and but I did clear out one of my other, I was gonna do a whole separate video on Borges and translation, so now I don't have to do that because I, I did it here. Maybe I'll put a timestamp in here and tell people when to stop listening. And the next book I will do in this series is the other one that I read week by week that's about eight hours long and is a, I won't say the name of it here, uh, it is a book originally written in English that I had read in English that's got a very popular movie made out of it and so, so I knew the story pretty well going in and I did the same thing, I bought an audio book of it which runs eight hours and I bought the ebook of the Spanish translation and I, and I'll talk more about that next time I do one of these, which who knows when that'll be. Okay, BookTube, peace.